Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Kingdom Rush Elemental Uprising by Lucky Duck Games and Ironhide Game Studios, the guys who made the mobile game for Kingdom Rush. Kingdom Rush is a tower defense game. Now, this is the second version or variant to the original Kingdom Rush game, also made by Lucky Duck and Ironhide. And in this game, just like the other, you are playing a puzzle tower defense game. The minions are going to come from different spawn points across a board, which is basically a map, along a path attempting to get to the goal or the end. If they do, they're going to remove your health markers, and if you ever hit zero, you're going to lose the game. But don't fret, you have a few ways you can deal with these enemy hordes. One way is the towers in the game. There are different values and tiers of towers that you can purchase, as with your starting currency or enemies that you defeat, you'll spend this currency and improve upon your towers and upgrade them and place them down on the game board. Utilize puzzle pieces to cover up certain enemy units to defeat them. Additionally, you'll have your hero, and this hero might have additional powers that you can utilize that will allow you to move across the game board and smash, stomp, and explode different portions of the enemies. Don't be alarmed as well, you can actually use your hero himself or herself to stand on the game board and defeat enemies that way, but if you don't manage to, you can be injured. The game is over after a number of rounds if you haven't defeated enough enemies, and there's also different challenges, as well as a bit of a legacy aspect to the game, but nevertheless, each game plays uniquely. Will you defeat the enemies in Kingdom Rush and complete the horde, or will you be trampled and your kingdom destroyed? Find out as I talk about how to get out the game, the basic idea of how to play, and of course, my review. Also, if you will, before we start the game off, I really would appreciate you to subscribe to the channel if you appreciate the type of videos we do, and of course, hit that like button and bell notification button. But without further ado, let's go ahead and start with setup. So setting up the game Kingdom Rush Elemental Uprising is very similar to the base game. And I have another video linked down below in the description where I'll explain the basic idea for setup for that game. There's not a whole lot of differences with this game, but I'll go ahead and cover the basic idea. In the game, there are scenarios, and each scenario is going to explain a different setup for a different terrain course. The game is going to give you tiles that you'll lay out and set up to create the course for the game. There are going to be path areas, there are going to be blockers, as well as places like the woods that people do not go in but towers can be placed in, and there's also going to be starting spawn points, maybe one, two, or three of them or more, as well as stacks of enemies, which are also explained in the rulebook. Each one is unique, but basically they'll say like, put a zero monster tier on the top that is green and then the next one is a one tier that is orange and so on and so forth and there's stacks for each of the waves. The end of it's going to have kind of a shield looking thing with your HP markers. This determines how long you have or how many units can pass without you losing the game as well as currency that you'll start the game off with as well. And of course, there's also going to be these trays here that you're going to add to your uh, monster hordes as they come out onto the game board here so that you can kind of realize which ones are in play and what you need to place in order to defeat them. There's also the towers over here. The towers can be set up pretty much anywhere, but they need to be stacked in tiers of one, two, three, and if you're playing with more than the advanced original version of the game or the first scenario or so, as well as the training stuff, there's a fourth one as well that you can upgrade to. I suggest placing all the tokens for all the towers somewhere within reach next to each of the towers that they are useful for. Each player is also going to get a character, whether it be Saitam or Daedra or one of the other uh, many, that I think there's a total of five. The, uh, also the character miniature, which are on a square base, which I'll explain why later. Uh, the character card, which is how you use your ability. A health marker that tracks your HP that you'll place in the far right hand side. And then of course, a helper card along with any useful tokens for that specific hero. Each hero is gonna have unique tokens that they're going to start with, but for everything else, they're gonna get a card, a miniature, and a health marker. Each scenario is also going to come with unique types of abilities or like locations that will prevent or help you in some unique way. You can go ahead and set up slide any of those cards next to you guys as well. Anything you don't need, like maybe additional boss cards or additional miniatures or stands or extra mobs can all be left in the box. You're not going to actually have almost all of this stuff. You'll have maybe about a third to two thirds of what you see here on the field. So maybe it'll be a little bit less cluttered. But for the review, I think it'd be easier to have it all here so I can kind of go over everything with you. As well as, of course, an additional sticker sheet, which you can set aside as you will not be using it until the end of the game and the adjacent map and any other legacy content. Okay, there's also going to be a hero abilities, which depending on the scenario you're playing, you're going to be utilizing these guys here. 
And you're also going to have upgrade sheets. Upgrade sheets are new to uh, Elemental Uprising that can be added to cards and tiles and the, the like that will give you a benefit of some sort. These are like restickable uh, pieces here that you can kind of just put on this and then unstick and place back as you play each new scenario. And um, you can go ahead and set that next to some other area as well. But otherwise, that's the basic idea of the game. Set up the board, all the scenario components, and each character along with all the bits and pieces they have, and start the game. So just like the original Kingdom Rush board game, Elemental Uprising is a very similar beast and has very similar components. The differences are a few rule changes that I've noticed, as well as, of course, the upgrades. And, of course, literally all the bosses and scenarios and objectives are all different, but the gameplay is very similar. Basically, this helper card will explain what you need to do in the game. The first thing you're always going to do is spawn new hordes. If it's the first round of the game, you can ignore this because the game scenario will actually tell you which hordes spawn first on the game mat and where they're going to be located. Make sure that whenever you spawn hordes, they're going to have this little, there's a little barrier that's like purple and green and make sure that it's set facing downward on the map. Uh, downward is basically whatever you see on the scenario. So I'll go ahead and take all these guys out that are the starting ones and I will flip them over and now I have my three starting hordes for this first scenario. Afterwards, you'll pass on to the next phase. But remember, every phase after, every round after this one, you will spawn new hordes. And the way you do that is you'll start with horde number one, which is the marker with a one on it, and you'll flip one of those over and add a tray and put it in the closest uh, front position. And then you'll flip over the number two as well as that and place it down in the tray. And for each one, you'll do that. The next portion, though, is play a tower and play hero cards. This is where players can simultaneously uh, or individually, one at a time, in any order, play one of their heroes or play a tower that they have. And the other option they have is they can actually upgrade a tower for free, but that means they can't utilize it until the next game round. The game is going to start off with a certain number of towers for each player. So you can divide uh, amongst the players however you'd like. In this specific scenario, I've got two archer towers, and I also have a militia tower that are all tier one. And if I wanted to, I could give uh, one to Satam and one archer to Daedra, and then so on and so forth until I have none left. But I'll just show you them here because it's easier to see them. But basically, um, you can play one of these towers. The only places you can play them as your hero is on a space of the hero's color that you're choosing. So I am playing as a Tom, which means that I've got a green space here and I have a green space here that I can place down my archer tower that they gave me at the beginning of the scenario. Uh, whenever you place down your towers, you can place them however you want. But remember that the spaces that the arrows on the tower point to are where you can actually deal damage to the enemies. Once you place a tower, you will enact its ability, and each tower has a unique ability as to where it fires, what it fires, as, as opposed to, like, as in, in, in an explanation as to, like, what type of tetromino or tile that you'll place down on one of these bosses or mob areas. And, of course, um, once you place it down, it's done. You've utilized it for this round, but you'll get it back at the end of the round. The other option you can take is your hero. You'll take your hero card marker, which should be off to start the game, and place it on when you want to activate it. So that way you know when you've activated him or her. And you will place it down anywhere you want to start the game off with. There's a few rules about heroes. You can't place them on towers, and they can't end up on a space another hero is at. But you may move them based on their movement speed under their HP. They're referenced by boots. One boot is one movement, two is two. You get the idea. When you land on a space, you can cover it up utilizing your square base and that should cover up up to four monsters if you're prepared for doing so. Heroes can basically cover up pretty much anything in the game and it counts as damage. But remember though whenever you land on a base at the end of the round if the base isn't destroyed and it moves it can prevent movement by having a hero on it and that hero will simply take a damage. Uh, your heroes are also going to have unique abilities like for instance Satom has the ability that whenever I move through an adjacent one, one of the areas with mobs, I can actually take one of my markers and place it on the area I have just passed through. So he can do additional damage in that way. And additionally, after I've finished movement with him, I can choose a basic attack. My basic attacks are these little two by ones that I can place on the board that I am standing on. Some of these characters have range, which means you can play adjacent to the space he, is he or she is currently on. And others are melee, they have a little fist. This is the symbol for being close up and then the Hadouken symbol is the arranged where you'll be able to actually select based on where the character is pointing which of the tiles you can do your damage with. The last action is simply to swap um, or pass one of these towers here if you have one like let's say I have these, this archer and this militia 
I can go ahead and take this and give it to uh, this character over here, which will, it will then go into their incoming towers. They can't use it for this round, but on the following round, they can actually upgrade the archer tower that I've given her um, to a tier two archer. And then from tier two, I can upgrade it to tier three. After you've done playing your towers, activating your heroes and moving them, attacking with them, or choosing to pass towers to upgrade them, you'll move on to destroying horde trays. Basically, each of these horde trays has a number of enemies. When all the enemies are filled up, you have basically been able to defeat it. And at the end of the round, if it is covered, you will take it out and remove it and gain the benefit on the back hand of the tile. Uh, sometimes it'll be coins, other times it could be diamonds. Uh, there's a variety of different types of resources you will gain as you defeat these. After that, you flip over this guardian and you move on to advancing horde trays. Any hordes still left on the field are gonna move their number of spaces. Some of them might move more than one, in which case they might pass up any tiles that are currently being uh, blocking a space. So in one case, if I have my tile that has enemies on it, and I need to move two, but I can only move one and then the next space is being blocked, they'll simply go over that space to the next available one. And of course, if they leave the area, you're going to take damage. And you will take damage based on the number of enemies still alive on this tile here. Some of the enemies will take one damage, some of them will take more. Obviously, if an entire tile gets through, you're going to lose the game. Um, but yeah, you'll move these guys around. And then after that, you're simply going to pick up tower and hero cards. You'll take all of your activate hero cards and remove them from your board and any towers that you have placed on the game board and you will bring them back to the player who utilized them. And the way you can tell is by these little, they're like little see-through cards that have the illustration of the color of the hero that you are playing. Sometimes you need to give a color to a certain hero because their colors don't always match. Then after that, you're going to buy towers and mods. You will spend your giant gems and your coins to buy towers. Based on the tier of the tower will be a certain cost that you can then give to anybody. And the same thing is said for the mods here as well. There's certain mods that you can use from uh, different scenarios to different other scenarios that you'll use to attach to your towers to do additional damage. And you'll rinse and repeat. You'll keep going there, adding new monsters to the game board and attacking them and having them move and then purchasing other towers and upgrades and up until one thing happens or another. And each scenario is a little different, but this one here specifically says that at the end of the last round after the last monsters have come out, if any monsters are left remaining, or if enough of your HP has been reduced to zero, you lose. And the only way to win is to cover up all of the tiles and defeat them before the round ends. And that's basically the idea of the game. It is a puzzle game because you're using a bunch of different tetrominoes and it is also a tower defense game because hordes of enemy minions are moving through the game board to get to the end to remove your life total. Okay, so what do I think about this game? I've talked about the, game, the original game as it stood and um, I wanna talk about some of the more expansion content that this game has. I have not covered through all this game. There's a lot of it, so I haven't got to play a lot of the big bosses yet, so I'm excited to do so. But let's cover what I do know. So there's a lot of caveats for Kingdom Rush as far as the different things you can do and things I did not cover because there is a ton of content in this game. Um, I'll try and cover a little bits and pieces here and there as I talk about it, but I wanna first address the changes that I think are excellent about this game. The first change that I noticed that I hope I'm correct on, because it's been a while since I played the original, but when you upgrade towers by giving one to somebody else in the original game, you always have to pass in a certain direction. I believe it's clockwise or counterclockwise. In this one, you can pass to literally anybody and at the end of the round, you'll be able to upgrade the tower that you have in your incoming and then afterwards you'll be able to put it into your usable pile. And that's a great new way in which you can kind of uh, control the board as to where you want to give people towers and what towers they need to control and then how you want to upgrade them. Another cool thing about this game too is they've included a bunch of unique uh, reference cards to bonus scenario um, aspects. Like for instance, this magic blossom card here says that whenever you stand on it, it becomes triggered and two different hordes can take one damage where, and then you will flip this to the withered side so that you can no longer use it. And a, these specific blossoms have their own little tokens that you can utilize. So as a last ditch effort, if you cannot do enough damage or maybe the enemies are too far away, you can use the magic blossom to do extra damage. 
Another cool thing about this game too is the upgrades. I know for a fact that the upgrades were not a thing, uh, or modifiers I should say, were not a thing in the original base game. In this one here, these are little peelable things that you can stick on, kind of like those stickers you would stick onto a window. Now it's been transferred to board games, which is excellent, works really well. And you can place them on your cards to give benefits, whether it be to do extra damage, to be able to angle in different areas or place out a swordsman. Um, you'll be able to do uh, true damage to enemies where sometimes certain damage can't be dealt to them. It has to be a certain type and that can change a tower's damage cycle. And of course, other modifications as well. Uh, the other good things about this game are just like in the original game, it's going to have a unique number of scenarios. Each of them are going to come with these stickers that you can add to the board here, thusly improving upon like the uh, system of I two star this scenario or I three star it. I can move on to the next one and you can go choose any scenarios that you want and any difficult you'd like facing different challenges, giving yourself a wide variety and range of like customization and choice when it comes to playing Kingdom Rush. Uh, the board is beautiful and the map is beautiful. It does a great job of explaining what it feels like to move through the world of Kingdom Rush in detail and each of the different areas has their own unique stars that you can add and completion symbols that you can undergo. Uh, there are five new characters to the game, each with unique abilities. My guy is able to move across different locations and do damage as he moves, whereas Deidre is able to whenever a soldier is removed, if not defeated, and instead she will do the respective damage for them when they leave. So you want to usually use soldiers to prevent movement or finish off tiles, but her, she'll actually give them as a source of damage. Or maybe you're playing as the character Elora, um, the Winter Song hero, where she has Winter is Coming. Whenever she does damage to certain tiles, she's able to do additional damage to those tiles, provided that she had damage on them. And then Alaric. Alaric has unique minions that he uh, can send out onto the field, and he kind of uses them as additional characters that can either A, do damage to certain tile spaces, or B, be used, used to prevent damage being dealt to our heroes. Because when our heroes pass away in this game, they're kind of uh, sleeping for a round. They have to like come back. And it is a detriment to lose a hero for a round. You need every little bit of damage you can get in this game. Uh, the quality of the game is excellent, just like the original Kingdom Rush. All the miniatures are beautiful, highly detailed, cool little characters that you can obviously paint. The tile boards are a um, wide variety of them, not a huge amount, but they are both double-sided, and there are a number of them that have a 1x1, one one, a 2x2, two two, a 2x1, two and you kind of create and customize these boards with a different look and feel based on the map which is great. The number of different upgrades and towers you can have is wide and they each vary in their own unique ways and have their own benefits and their own faults. And each character has their own customizations as far as abilities he or she might get that you can utilize as well as basic attacks and passive abilities and their basic stats. Overall, this is a puzzle game. It is literally about putting tetrominoes onto different boards, trying to do as much damage as you can, and selecting the most uh, accurate placement you can throughout the game. That being said, this game is really, really difficult. It was way challenging. Maybe I'm just terrible at uh, tower defense games, but we had a tough time with the first scenario and the second scenario as well. I think we only actually beat it once or twice when playing through this, this game in a, a wide variety of scenarios. Um, and you have to be very precise with your actions as far as you move and how you make your characters do damage. Whenever you make a mistake with planning, and that will happen with more players because each player is going to have their own individual characters and their abilities as well as their towers as to where they want to select what spots they go in are kind of limited. Some spaces are not as great for certain towers as others, and you have to kind of prepare for that and realize purple's got a lot of corners, not a lot of up, down, left, right spaces to do damage to enemies. So we're not going to give purple the... I don't know, bombardment tile. Maybe we're gonna give purple the archers that can damage anywhere as they get upgraded. Uh, maybe we'll upgrade certain towers to make them more usable in spaces that typically are not going to be so usable. And so being precise in this game, making every little damage count is so important. Sometimes letting a few guys go through is not a bad idea. You'll lose life, but you won't ultimately lose the scenario. If you don't mind a tight, difficult, but fun and challenging type of a puzzle slash a tower defense game, then you're going to really enjoy Kingdom Rush. It has all the quality that you would want, just like the base game. If you enjoyed the base game and its challenges, then you're going to love Elemental Uprising as well. All the unique new components, the new bosses, the new scenarios, it all comes in this game and it fills it out very well. All the quality, all the artwork is all 
Excellent. This is a game I'm going to bring out in very certain occasions though because there's a lot of setup to this game. Some of it can be better explained as far as how you take your hordes and how you stack them, what hordes you're going to have. Um, as far as each of the scenarios having a no, no, it's not super crazy what each character has to do, but the overall setup is quite a bit in this game. And then additionally, it's challenging. And when you lose outright, like you're, you just, you lose the scenario. If you lose all your health or you end with nothing, kind of has some feel bad moments. And sometimes you feel like you did everything you could. And it's really just, you didn't realize there are other options that you could have made to make better choices in the game. But either way, there are those moments where you're like, Geez, how could we have even beaten this? And you have to go back and feel the mistakes that you made and choose better choices. And obviously with more players comes more room for mistake. All the additional components like the mods and the way you can place the towers to other players to make them improved, being able to buy upgraded tiles as well as being able to buy the mods is a great feeling and being able to move between the different scenarios and improve upon your strategy is a great feeling overall. I love Kingdom Rush, I love the mobile game, it's a lot of fun, and I love complex challenging games with lots of thought and this has all of that. So if you're looking for this type of game, this is what I would definitely suggest you taking a look at. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Kingdom Rush Elemental Uprising, the newest Kingdom Rush from Lucky Duck Games and Iron High Game Studios. If you're interested in picking up the game, there's a link down below in the description where you can go ahead and check out this title. As well as check out the live streams every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST. And like I said before, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to the channel, hitting that subscribe button, the bell notification button, and of course, if you would like the like button. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to defending the kingdom uh, while rushing <laughs> with you next time. That's so bad it wasn't even a dad joke. <laughs>